So, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Armin Schwarzbach. Uh, Dr. Schwarzbach hails from Germany. He's a medical doctor and specialist in laboratory medicine. He's the founder of Armin Labs. Uh, he's been at the forefront of tick-borne research for more than 20 years. His expertise in diagnosing and treating infectious diseases is second to none. He lectures across the world and has tested over 30,000 patients. He's a member of ILADS uh, and the board member of the German Boreolis, uh, uh, Boreolis Society, and he's an, ex an expert on the advisory committees for Lyme disease in Australia, Canada, Ireland, and France, and obviously Germany. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Armin, uh, a personal close friend, uh, and a wonderful colleague. I look forward to his lecture. Thank you. So you can hear me? Thank you. Thank you for AOR for the invitation here tonight. This. I'm a fan of Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> I saw them in your stadium, you're fantastic. So congratulations. And the ice hockey professionals, they don't have risks for tick bites because the ticks, they survive from minus 20 centigrades up to seven centigrades, but ice hockey players, I don't know any prominent people. So what I want to talk today is um, about Lyme co-infections and also some viral infections. We don't have the time to go all through it, I think my takeaway message should be that you learn about how to diagnose Lyme disease in the best way in this time frame we are living in. My model is a very common model, and you see intracellular are always bacteria and viruses. Whichever discipline you do in homeopathy or naturopathy, you will not come over that point because you will see that a lot of your patients are suffering from that and you have to treat them for bacterial infections, viral infections, and they are the core of all we are doing. Very important for me is also to look at genetics and epigenetics. This is very important and also the personal history. You do an anamnesis, I think you ask your patients for symptoms and differentials and then you think what could it be, what could it not be, it's like a computer system, it's working in your brain. And you also ask for differentials, I mentioned, you ask for allergies, intolerances, you ask also for accidents, traumatic accidents, surgeries, your patients, you ask for immune stressing factors for sure, you ask for the dental status, no, you're not doing that, this is the job of the dentist, but the dentists are not looking at Lyme disease, for example. Also, the past or present comorbidities are important, this is all the personal history you have to look at. But this is not all. You have in this model peeling the onion, you have also to look at occupational hazards, you have to look at pesticides, you should look at the geostress, you should look at the electromagnetic fields, which is a very important thing, I, I believe, or I think, or I know. Also, you should look at environmental toxins, environmental medicine, and you should look at the heavy metals in the patients, what you need, and a big problem in the world will be more and more contaminated water. So we have a complexity in each patient which is different from the other patient and the model is peeling the onion and that's a job of you. All of you, we are working in the medical fields. So we are not all experts for that, but what we need is networking together. Otherwise we cannot solve or we cannot come to the core. And for the core, you need some people who are specialized in infections or let me say, for the soul infections or yeast or mold. So the model is a, a big model and I think it's a challenge for us in medicine. What has happened in the last 20 years, um, I studied in the 80s uh, medicine, I'm a medical doctor and I qualified for laboratory work. What happened after my qualification, um, more spe specialization? I worked in endocrinology, I worked also in gynecological endocrinology, so I worked in different fields, but highly specialized. But what I have lost completely is the whole body medicine. We have to look at the whole patient, also of the uh, anamnesis of traveling around the world, for example, of the domestics, what's going on in the families. So it's very important to do good anamnesis, and if you do it, you can do 95% uh, of your diagnosis by simply asking the patient. What happened in the last years? 
no time for the patient in Germany. We have five minutes time for one patient, and it's really impossible to do all of these jobs. So um, that's really a challenge for us. I don't know how to solve that, but so we have to go back to the roots in medicine to learn um, to take a patient honest and to care for all of these fields. What they worked off right? That's a chameleon. And a chameleon is very difficult um, to catch, to find out, to diagnose, and also to do therapies with this chameleon. It changes structures, it changes therapies, behavior. So you have really a challenge with polyabogdorfri. Polyabogdorfri is the causing pathogen for Lyme disease, Lyme borreliosis, it's named. This is our oldest patient. I tell it very often. It's uh, the Iceman, let's see, from Europe. It's a 5,300 years old patient, and this patient, or uh, let's see, the Iceman, he tried to treat himself because he had some. Um, treatment behind his right knees. This Iceman didn't know that it was Lyme disease, but these scientists, they found polyabog right in the bones of this Iceman. That's really interesting. 5,300 years old patient. So he was not treated for that. He had surely pain, he had arthritis, whatever. Uh, he didn't die by that. But um, we don't know what he has for symptoms. Nobody knew about that. So how old is Lyme disease? How old is the pathogen? How old is polyabog right? What do you think? Some ideas of the students? How old is polyabog right? The pathogen? Come on, I think you know in Canada how old is polyabog right? The oldest bacteria in the world, no, not the oldest. You know Jurassic Park and to isolate DNA? This is what happened. How, is the, how old is the oldest tick? How can you find it out? The oldest tick was found in Amber. The oldest tick is 40 million years old. 14 million years, I'm talking about that. And the Maria Bogdorfri, we know, 15 million years old, pathogen, 15 million years. So it's no young disease. When was Maria Bogdorfri detected? Who did it? That was really Bogdorfri, he gave the name, he died some years ago. And uh, it's named Maria Bogdorfri. Is it a young disease? No, it's old disease. But when did he find found out that? He found it out in 1981. By a longer story, very funny, it was in Lyme, Lyme Connecticut, and they named it Lyme disease because some of these children they had joined arthritis, like the Iceman maybe, and then they didn't know what was the reason behind it. 1981. That was the time when the first patient with HIV came up, Freddie Mercury. 1981, I remember exactly. So for us in the medical world, it's a very young disease, but the pathogen is very old, 50 million years old. So, we need a lot of science and all about it. Did we solve HIV problems? No, we didn't solve it. So, did we solve Borrelia problems? No, we didn't solve it. But this is the story is going more and more on with this Iceman. If you have the Iceman, 5,300 years old, every scientist wants to do something with the Iceman. And now a working group, it's here in Toronto. Interestingly, a dental working group from the university, I don't know where they are. They found in the teeth and in the bones of this Iceman that Borrelia burgdorferi is doing osteopenia. So this Iceman has a bonus by Borrelia burgdorferi. And if you know a little about medicine, osteopenia is the pre-step before you are getting osteoporosis. Now the question is coming up, could osteoporosis be based on a tick bite on a Borrelia burgdorferi infection? Who knows about that? Nobody, but they are working on it. And if that will really come to reality, that Borrelia burgdorferi is the pathogen or belongs to the differential diagnosis or differentials um, for osteoporosis, then you have to look maybe for Borrelia antibodies in osteoporosis, which is a crazy, crazy thing. You all look for vitamin D or calcium, whatever, phosphate, but nobody's looking for Lyme disease, for Borrelia burgdorferi infection, osteoporosis. Nobody's doing that. So, there's a new challenge for us, and more and more is coming out now by these new models and new techniques. This technique behind this is a PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. It won the Nobel Prize always in the 80s, and uh, the polymerase chain reaction we found out more and more in this Iceman. And Oliver Dorfry plays really an important role in this. This is Bulls Aresh. Um, this is named also Erythema micans. Borrelia burgdorferi is one of the only bacteria in the world which can move actively from place A to place B. Active movement. 
This is not possible by coli or let me say also Klebsiella or some other bacteria or uh, Yersinia. These are lazy bacteria, but Borrelia burgdorferi is a very active bacteria and it can move everywhere around your body. And that makes it really complicated how to diagnose. And then there was a tick in this patient of mine. Um, it doesn't look typically like Bulls Aresh, but that was really Erythema micans, Bulls Aresh in this patient, an atypical variation. I treated the patient with doxycycline, this uh, all medical doctors do that in the world, and then this Bulls Aresh vanished within a few days. What would happen if you don't treat this patient? We don't know. Maybe only as moving somewhere in the body and doing some infections, localized infections in the body. We don't know. What would have happened if we would not be diagnosed? That's a dark number we have. But very important for children. You will find a lot of children also. These are really problematic because um, the children are on this uh, height where the ticks are coming up to 1.50 meters. And you saw here, as you see here, uh, the tick is not there. But this is a typical Bulzaresh behind the ear. So if you have a child, uh, a child or children in your office, you always have to look in the hair region or behind the ear, not to over uh, see that uh, Bulzaresh. That could be problematic. This is a very, very big Bulzaresh in this patient, surely misdiagnosed. Hi, how can it get such a big? Because it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the Bulzaresh. You can live with it. You can get very old with it. Um, but it doesn't make sense to live with an infection in your body because it's spreading around your body and you don't know where the pathogen, Borrelia is moving in your body. So to summarize, stage one means a fresh infection, recent infection, current infection, bulls rashes. The transmission, we name it, transmission from the tick to into the body of the human, or maybe also domestics, we can maybe related to that, uh, can happen five days up to seven days, latest seven up to 11 weeks. So if you have a tick bite today, you have to look three months at your patient if a bull's arash can happen. We know that. But the doctors are not doing that. They look immediately if the bull's arash or not, and if the bull's arash is there, then should they treat. But if there's no bull's arash, the patient is not treated. So that's problematic. And also for me, very important that you take away this message. 20% of you getting a tick bite in the summer flu. A summer flu after a tick bite in 20% of the patients means an active infection with polio or cough, right? It's a summer flu. So if you have a summer flu, you go to a general practitioner, you say, oh, I have a tick bite, I have a summer flu now, what will your doctor do? Nothing. Because he doesn't know about the correlation of this bulls or not bulls uh, with the summer flu after tick bite with the transmission of polyvoctor for 20% of the patients. We have a lot of uh, papers about it. More and more problematic, chameleon. We have the next point. Just 30 up to 40% of Lyme patients develop bulls arash. Just uh, up to 40%. That depends on the subspecies. We have different subspecies also in Europe. We have Carinia, Arcelia, and then the Stricto. And not all are doing this bulls are So, dirty up to 40%, they don't get a bulls are but they get infected by Lyme disease. Dirty up to 40%, uh, just develop bulls are What about the 70 others, 70% others of their patients? And for me, also very problematic. Uh, do you feel a tick bite? Uh, no, you don't feel a tick bite. Why should you feel it? It's like going to a dentist and you get anesthesia because the tick is doing anesthesia and you don't feel a tick bite. And just don't have to 40% of chronic sick Lyme patients remember a tick bite. You can ask them. And you find already antibodies in them. Don't have to 40%. That makes it really difficult to diagnose. It's chameleon. In other infections, it's easier to diagnose, but not Lyme disease. So what happens if you uh, misdiagnose or not treated? Um, Borrelia burgdorferi can move everywhere around your body. Everywhere. And this is named stage two. Stage two means um, a recent organ manifestation because it likes the organ system. The organ system means the peripheral nerve system, or the central nerve system, the joints, the tendons, your heart, your eyes, your bladder, maybe your liver, your gallbladder, whatever. Your liver can move everywhere. It's an active moving bacteria, I told you before. 
Stage two means a reason, but what does it mean if you get chronic? You have this infection longer than one year, some say six months, in your body. That means chronic. So how to diagnose a, a chronic live infection that makes it really difficult for doctors. It's not so difficult to diagnose stage two, the reason for the manifestation, because some of, I don't know if you have seen that here in Canada, but this patient can develop a Bell's palsy. This is a young man on the right side, also children can develop that. And this is stage one or stage two, that means a very fresh infection of forever dog. Then you take the spinal fluid, uh, this looks like a apoplectic stroke, so, so we are, uh, but the reason was a tick bite. A tick bite makes this. So you know Canadians are traveling all over the world, I know a lot of Canadians traveling to Europe, you got uh, I'm from Bavaria, you got bitten by a tick in Bavaria, then you can develop that. It must not happen in Canada. It can happen in Australia. No, Australia is Australia's lime like illness thing. So it's similar to life. What about the uh, knee, the arthritis, the Iceman had this problem. The knee can be swollen, but need not to be swollen. The knee can be swollen. And now we come into the field with hypomyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, we'll discuss it later. What can it be? Yes, um, maybe you say the Iceman had rheumatoid arthritis in his knee. Nobody knew about that. Nowadays he would get corticosteroids, but at that time he didn't know. So the arthritis can also get chronic, and then they say, oh, I have a tennis elbow, I have arthritis in the hip, I have a carpal tunnel syndrome or something like that. What's a carpal tunnel syndrome? Could it be Lyme disease? How do you do surgery? Does it make sense to do surgery with the infected uh, carpal tunnel syndrome? No, it doesn't make sense. But so Lyme disease can imitate this. It's a big mutator. Hmm? Lyme disease is a big mutator. We all know that from millions, thousands of patients we have in the world. And this is not what I'm talking just for myself. I mean, this is what I didn't uh, learn at my university, it was good university in microbiology, but nobody told me that. Um, 20 to 30 percent of autistic disorders of autism can be caused by Borrelia. Lyme disease can do autism, you know that. This is a study from Bob Mansfield. And 58 percent of these patients, also with autism, had mycoplasma infections or have mycoplasma infections. We come to the multiple infection. Multiple infections. All patients have multiple infections. There's no, not one patient with just Lyme disease. We'll find it out later. So what about multiple sclerosis? Lyme can mimic multiple sclerosis. It can be the reason for multiple sclerosis, like symptoms I named it. Multiple sclerosis. What is multiple sclerosis? What's the reason for it? Maybe it's Lyme disease. Then you have a treatment option. It could be myelopathies, polyneuropathies, brain tumor. I do a lot of presentations about cancer and different pathogens now. Also autoimmune disorders. Hashimoto's can be Lyme disease, for example. That's proven, we know that. It can cause meningitis, it can do encephalitis, neuritis, every itis, itis, itis means infection, localized infections, everywhere around the body, very attributable. How long does it take to diagnose such a chronic patient? Three years we need, three years of medicine, that's horrible. All patients I've seen, I've seen 20,000 patients, in my blood, I don't know. They all are coming, they all are mailing. 30,000 patients misdiagnosed, that's a horrible number. And this is just the top of our stone. We have uh, a lot of these chronic um, misdiagnosed patients. 90%, sorry, go back. 90% of these chronic Lyme patients, they all have chronic fatigue, or let me say 99%. Um, just a little, what do you say about this number? I think 99, they all have gone out on the team. They say uh, it happened after the tick bite, they feel very sick. And the medical world is not accepting that. And that's really a, a shame for all of us. We have to accept your patient tells your doctor, I have chronic fatigue syndrome now, I feel I've gone out after tick bite. Uh, please diagnose me maybe for Lyme disease. The patient should not know, you should know about it. We need the medical doctors, we need the universities for that. Most fibromyalgia patients, uh, they also are light positive. You can treat them successfully. Or they can do Parkinsonism, also studies about that. And that's very important for me, Alzheimer's disease. We have studies about light dementia, that it exists, 
and it has a good outcome after antibiotics. We can treat, or you can treat maybe with drugs. We don't know. You can treat Alzheimer's successfully. Okay, if you die, if you diagnose too late, becoming too late, we cannot treat this patient. Give them a chance, give them an option. It belongs to differentials. That's easy to say. I don't want to say that every Alzheimer's patient I am realistic enough about that has no Lyme disease, but it belongs to differential diagnosis. That's for sure. Absolutely. So a patient is coming to you. Um, you do your good work with the patient, you ask for a tick bite, the patient says no, I don't have a tick bite. Can you exclude the patient now from Lyme disease? No, because you have learned that just 30 up to 30 percent of all patients remember a tick bite. Must the patients uh, do they have uh, a pulsa rash? No, they must need not have pulsa rashes, you know, just 30 up to 40 percent. You have learned little now about that very important question. Uh, you can find it out. Then the patient says, Oh, doctor, I have a neck pain. I have on this side a little headache. It's coming from the left side. And then my next question. Was the tick bite on your left side? Mm -hmm. Because Borrelia is moving first on this side where you start with your symptoms in the beginning, in the beginning, but then it's moving away. So you can get fatigue. Every patient you ask with a chronic Lyme disease, they all have chronic fatigue syndrome, everybody. They have tingling, ants running, numbness, needle burning, burning hands, burning feet, on one side very atypical, very difficult for neurologists, now the neurologists coming to this field, they have the neck pain, the neck stiffness on the side where the tick bite was, then it's moving on the other side, the headache is like helmet, uh, they have a helmet there, it's coming and going, it's a changing situation, you have shoulder pain on this side where the tick bite was, you have headache, you have dizziness, you have changing um, I can join pain, all joints are possible, but it starts um, in most cases where the tick bite was. So you can work on that and you find out, and the second patient, the tick bite was on the left side. And then, yeah, I had an insect bite, I was in Thailand, they say to me, yeah, doctor, you're correct. And then I got sick after that. That was uh, the origin of it, in Thailand, not here in Canada, it was in, in some other countries. You can also develop a general weakness of the body, the cup is falling, down from your hands and a feverish reaction. I've talked about you can get the mental strain, depressions, the very important the patients, they all get serotonin deficiencies after a while by the chronic inflammation by the water sites in invasion to the brain. So you can measure the serotonin levels, so if you treat them uh, with antidepressive remedies, and this is where we all send these patients in Germany, the psychiatric hospitals, they are filled completely in Germany. There's no space for all these life patients, you know. They're also in Europe looking pretty good. I cannot see you, you, you have disease, but maybe you suffer from Lyme disease and you are treated for rheumatoid arthritis. Who knows? Also, all you have multiple sclerosis vaccines. Nobody knows. So back pain is very common also in 58% sleeplessness. This is a very interesting symptom. No other infection in the world is doing it. All of your patients, if you ask them for Lyme disease, they got awake 2 or 4 o'clock after midnight. They have really a heavy night sweat. Um, the, bed is, the bed is full of, uh, uh, from the sweatening of this patient and the beginning of the illness. And then it, it, it will get better. And uh, this is after midnight. But don't tell your patients, you know more than the patients, some uh, the patients don't know that. Um, the melatonin has a deficiency at that time, so you can also look at the melatonin at that time and all that. And the cell phones play a role in this also. But ask your patient, do you get awake after midnight or before midnight? That's a neutral question. Is there a doctor after midnight? I ask the next question, is it between which time? Is it two o'clock? They say, yes, you're correct, two or three. You can ask them. Um, in some doctors, they say it's a Babesia infection. Babesia is a malaria like infection. It makes this night sweat also. So, we have to look at the differentials for Babesia. So, throat, you have to think of the BB infection, of Shandawas, for example. The tendency, or it is weakening your immune system. You get weakened, weakened, weakened by this chronic inflammation. But Besides the kind of we come later to the natural killer cells, how to measure. You can get purpose of the lips, for example, after a while, you can get the activation of EBV, opportunity infections, it's named. it's named. So you can get burning eyes, overproduction of tears, blood vision, double vision, lightheadedness. So many patients I've seen, they got classes without any reason. They got new teeth, teeth implants without any reason. Because inflammation was found in blood disease in this part of the body. You, you cannot treat an infection with glasses, that's not possible. You have to treat 
the nerve system. You have to, to bring it away from the body, and then you don't need the glasses. That costs a lot of money for, for the social systems and the health systems. You cannot imagine what it costs a misdiagnosis of this lung disease. You cannot imagine. I don't want to make panicking, but that's reality. I see it each day. Okay? You can say, I'm specialized in this, I see it just this, but I can see also a lot of patients with other problems. That's I'm, I work in internal medicine also. This is interestingly you can get from our homepage, also free of any cost. This is a short symptom checklist for live audio, so it asks you um, all of the symptoms of this patient. You can get it free of any cost, patients without. And the question is how many symptoms must I have to say now I have Lyme disease? It could be Lyme disease can be localized inflammation, but it can spread around the body. So you need not to have 100 symptoms, but if you have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 symptoms, I think it's enough. And you have, you're really sick, and you go from doctor to doctor, you jump from your GP to neurologist, you to the orthopedic doctor, you have a lot of problems, you have problems with the um, dentist, and uh, you move around the doctor, you do some doctor hopping, and that costs you a lot of money, and a lot of patients, they get bankrupt for this. Now I come to the heart, a laboratory doctor, but laboratory, believe me, is also like a chameleon. It's not so easy to do because um, the antigenity of uh, Morelia is very difficult. This is a slide from our former islands president, Dan Cameron, and he says uh, it's difficult to say to culture Morelia. It's really difficult because it's a small number of pathogen from the blood, it's a slow probe of organism, it, it needs special culture media, and it can take up to 10 months, and we cannot wait 10 months to diagnose Lyme disease by culture. Also difficult if you have a biopsy or uh, you have the knee fluid of the CF, CSF, um, that makes also problems. It's really uh, bad to culture. And there are also no tests to determine the susceptibility of the pattern for different antibiotics for individual Lyme disease patients. These were the key sentences. What about PCR? PCR is good in the ticks, absolutely. Yeah, please keep your ticks, don't throw your tick away after you have got bitten by a tick. You can test the tick, it's easy to do tick tests, and then you see if the tick which has bitten you is full of Borrelia or some other uh, co-infections, Rickettsia, um, Bartonella, whatever. But the PCR in blood is really difficult to find for the Um The sensitivity, sensitivity means the false negative ones is 5 up to 25% sensitivity, so um, the low sensitivity in blood means the low level of spirochetes in the blood. We have the dark field microscopy, some of the specialists they say I see dark field microscopy, but the dark field microscopy it lacks specificity if it's really a correct positive result. The, the PCI is not so good in the blood, but if you have biopsies, biopsies make sense. But the pathologists they don't look at these pathogens. They look at histopathology, they look at, they look at the histopathology, but not by PCR for different pathogens. But this is so important. But they have to keep 10 years your biopsies, and then you can force them, give me my biopsy back, I want to do PCR on it. It's not expensive, 50 euro, and then you know which pathogen is in your tissue and makes you arthritis, or your uh, your nerve biopsy, then you can do that from nerve biopsy. Very interesting. So now this is a general, uh, Paul asked me to talk a little about the principle of immune defense. This is a basic of all the sound is great here in Canada. Um, the invader is coming into our body. The invader, invader in this um, situation is Borrelia burgdorferi. This can be, uh, this principle is for all infections in us, for all. That's not just for Borrelia burgdorferi. The macrophage is detecting the invader, and the macrophage is presenting the invader, Borrelia burgdorferi, to natural killer cells, here we are, and therefore we test for natural killer cells in Lyme disease, we test for the CD57 plus subpopulation. The macrophages also presents to um, the Th0 cell, and the Th0 cell is splitting into a Th1 cell and the Th2 cell. Th1 cell, to say it easy, are the lymphocytes, the Th2 system is at the end producing the antibodies, and the antibodies are destroying with the macrophages together in a complexity, um, and they release also the histamine at the end, so you get also histamine production in this patient, and it makes sense to treat them according to uh, this uh, histamine overproduction. 
HMLs. The Th1 cell, this is very important T cells, and there we look for the ILI spot, for example, for the interferotramarines, it says for the T cellular immune responses. Here we look for the antibody, antibody immune response, and here we look for the tubular cells. In HIV infections, we have exactly the same model. We have the antibodies, we have the CD4 helper cells, and we have the tubular cells, the CD56 cells. So in each infection, we have similar models. And this is a general model of our or your immune defense. And at the end, we try to destroy Borrelia. This is a summary of the immune competent cells. We have the CD57 natural killer cells. They are important to destroy the antigen antibody complexes. We have the Borrelia TH1 system, which destroys directly Borrelia burgdorferi. It can also destroy Chlamydia. They destroy Anaplasma, Yersinia, EBV, CMV, whatever you want. This TH1 system. And your laboratories are not looking at that. The problem is we have tuberculosis and we have big problems to find antibodies against tuberculosis. And nowadays we do the ALISPOT for it or the MELISA. We find it now T cellular immune defense. And this is very important to look at the T cellular immune defense. I know that you're not allowed, the natural person is allowed to do the ALISPOT here, but I hope the situation will change in the next years. And uh, cooperation partner ICL can help you and assist you and will support you. What we all know, know about is the IgG antibodies, IgM antibodies, but we know less about IgA antibodies. IgA is for me the parameter for the future, a localized inflammation marker, and you have it in Borrelia, you have it in Chlamydia, Mycoplasma, and all of these infections. So now I come to the TH2 system, and we have different techniques to find antibodies in, against infections. Um, we have the ELISA, we have the TICPLEX, BASIC, and we have the SERASPOT, and which is a micro -effect. So we have different techniques to detect antibodies. Now, the IgM antibodies. What is an IgM antibodies? IgM is the antibody you find in very early in the infection. But that doesn't mean that in chronic infections you need not to find the IgM antibodies. IgM is always uh, a hospital parameter. If you have an uh, infection, let me say, um, with chlamydia, chlamydia pneumonia, chlamydia trachomatis, your doctor or your hospital is doing correctly in the fresh infection, the IgM, absolutely. They will also do IgA, maybe some laboratories, and the IgG. But the IgM is the marker for the current for the recent infection. It has five binding arms and it destroys by that. Um, by this immune complexes and it needs complement and Borrelia to mention is very intelligent. Borrelia is suppressing C34A and the C3A. It suppresses the complement factor. Some subspecies of Borrelia suppress the complement factor so the um, antibodies cannot destroy Borrelia and the antibodies are useless. What does that mean? We don't need the antibodies at all. IgM. IgM appears early in the course of infection, and IgM is the parameter for a fresh, for a current, for recent infection. IgG. IgG is, you say, if I find IgG, it's a former infection. It's, it's an old infection. But in Lyme disease, this is not correct. We come later to that. IgG has four different subclasses. In Lyme disease, we have IgG1 and IgG subclass deficiencies. This is common in a lot of bacterial infections, IgG1 and IgG3 is low. And some doctors, they use also IVIG. They use intravenous immunoglobulins to treat these patients with immunoglobulin deficiencies. And they improve, they feel better, much better, and all these patients. So that was also done by Dr. Scani some years ago. And this is one of the IVG to treat patients with immunoglobulins to support the humoral, it's named the humoral immune system. So IgG, you all heard about that, I don't want to go into the deep of that, but IgG is our long-standing, long-term marker. What is a half-life time? Half-life time means that 50% of this concentration, you, um, IgG, IgM, they are proteins. Hmm? They are proteins and they all um, have a half-life time. So 50% are eliminated within some days. For IgM, 50% is eliminated within five days. For IgA, it's 14 days, and for IgG, it's 21 days. You find it in literature also. Half-life time is also important if you use some drugs. How long is the half-life time? When can I do testings? If I use prednisolone, 
These are all the questions coming up. Now we have a big, big problem with the CDC and um, the CDC, the Center of Disease Control in America, because they said, like in the HIV model, you naturopaths or you Canadian naturopaths, you Canadian doctors, you are just allowed to do Borrelia ELISA according to the HIV model. In the 80s, also we studied with HIV, ELISA, we had first the IFA, the first sense assays, and then we had ELISA techniques, um, and they are just allowing you to do the ELISA. But you have a big problem. You can do a Western blot, but you're not allowed to do that. In Germany, you're not allowed to do that. You're just allowed to do the ELISA. In some countries, they do the C6 ELISA and they say that's enough. But the immunoblot, which is a confirmation test, which is more specific, is more, also more sensitive, and that is a challenge. How to convince your authorities, um, not rolling the dice with the ELISA, the ELISA has a sensitivity of just 30% in chronic Lyme disease. We have a lot of papers. So 70% of chronic Lyme patients are misdiagnosed. If you just do ELISA, believe me, that's reality. And this is what I see daily in my laboratory. This is an ELISA negative, but full of Western blood bands. So what's that? A misdiagnosis, exclusion. The doctors write into the medical letter that these patients are excluded from chronic Lyme disease because Borrelia ELISA is false negative. No, they don't know about it. They believe in ELISA. And then you got lost. You got lost in Canada, you got lost in Finland, you got lost in Sweden. There's a lot of studies behind that. The insensitivity and the not standardization of that. Huh? inter assay regulation. Don't want to go in that, but it's very important to know don't trust the Borrelia ELISA. Apostrophe. Ten apostrophes. I'm fighting like hell for that. This is all literature behind this. This is all slide for me. I also looked at 50 of my chronic patients. Just 60% had antibodies. Just 60%. By the ELISA, just 30%. By Western blood, more than 30%. 60%. And we find a lot of this data. The sensitivity is a problem. False, negative, misdiagnosis of Lyme patients by doing just the ELISA and the Western blood. That's a big problem. That's a person in immunoplot. Uh, you can say immunoplot is the father and the children are western blot, the southern blot, and the northern blot. So these are the regulations and the eastern blot. There are four different regulations of this uh, blot. Uh, you must have known that if I did my laboratory approval, I have to know that and all punches, but now I forgot this one. We do the western blots. Western blots, but you have also eastern blots in Japanese, they do the eastern blots. There came a paper that was in 2017 um, by Professor Puri, a friend of mine, and Michael Cook, also friends from London. And they did uh, literature research of all papers about Borrelia ELISA, how confidential, how reliable are these ELISA, how reliable are the antibodies. And they compared it with HIV ELISA and HIV diagnostic tests. And they found that the Borrelia ELISA is 500 of times more false negative then the HIV uh, testings. That's horrible, horrible number. Tell it all your doctors in Canada. Don't believe your ELISA. Forget it. Forget it. Misdiagnosis. Bad misdiagnosis. You will find some. You will find, find some. But don't believe in that. They can exclude like an HIV. HIV, we didn't discuss it's 99.99%. You find it here. 0.095 false negatives in HIV diagnostic tests, but not in Lyme disease. For a report is chameleon, it depends on the antigenity, I don't want to go into the deep, it's really complicated. This is a study which I did, in, uh, I did two studies on the pleomorphic forms, because Borrelia is doing round bodies, cystic forms, pleomorphic forms, it's correct scientific name, it's not round bodies, it's uh, what you name it, round bodies, and also it does biofilms. What does it mean? We come later to therapies, you can talk about therapies, consequence of biofilms. Biofilms means protection. They mean also chatting rooms. They mean some uh, core sentiments. They chat, or it is chatting, but also chlamydia, so that might, it's slime. Biofilms are slime, slime production. The round bodies make it very complicated. Um, to destroy Borrelia because it's intracellular in these cases. Borrelia is in the macrophages. The macrophages cannot destroy some subspecies of Borrelia. We know by different models now. They survive in macrophages, in round bodies. And then they come out again, and then they're active again. So it's a hidden infection. It can persist, persist the infection, chronic, deactivated. Immune suppression makes deactivation, that's for sure. So, very important to remember 
Wrong parties, wrong parties, wrong parties, biofilms, 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 key messages. And therefore, a friend of mine, I was involved in scientific projects in the European Union, the Hyacinth project was a bike ship project, and we found out that time in 2011, we went to Finnish sauna, we were in and we looked at all the data, and we found, we found in my patients that a lot of them, they produce antibodies against brown bodies. Not against the whole spiropid, not against the whole pathogen, but against this strange pleomorphic forms, round bites, and you can culture them. If you culture them, then you can do a test, and now the test came up, and the test is named Tick Flex Basin. That's very important. I do a lot of these now, and I found, let me say, 89%, I found more positive ones by this Tick Flex Basin. This is about the bands. Everybody wants to know what's band, what's band, band means an antigen, it's part of Borrelia burgdorferi, but the round bodies are not in this, you know. If you send to other laboratories, they all don't have the round body testings. Antibodies against round bodies are one of the keys in the future that we will find up to 80-90% positive antibodies in chronic blind patients. This is the way we will go. VSE, please ask your laboratory and um, I think ICL or other laboratories, Quest or LabCorp, they have it meanwhile. In the 80s, we didn't have that in the 90s. It's a VLSE. VLSE means VMP like sequence expression site, and this is when Borrelia is dying. Your body is producing in vivo antibodies against Borrelia burgdorferi. So if you find VLSE positivity, that means all the site for in vivo active infection. And then we developed the new uh, microarray, or not me, but the test producers, all tests are uh, CD certified and IBD. And uh, this test is also internationally accredited. They have 96 wells. I have a booth there. I brought this, product, uh, this type with me, what we do in the laboratory in real life. These are the wells, and the wells are full of these antigens, and you put serum from the patients on it, or we do that, and then it's a binding and not a binding, and the antibodies are there, and we have all three different subspecies. So this is the new microarray, not new. Microarrays are a new method in laboratory medicine in the last six, seven years, and they're coming more and more, and they will uh, replace the Western blocks in a few years, I think so. So now about the T cells, just to go into the CDP7 cells. CDP7 cells are a subpopulation of the CDP6 cells, and they, if they are reduced, you can tell your patient, patient, you, are, you, are, uh, you have chronic pain, and you are longer than one year sick. This is, I can, tell you this is a really high predictive value for that, but CD57 cells can be also low in autism, that's the next slide, it can be also low in chlamydia infections, also in Bartonella infections, also in other bacterial infections, so CD57 are very important as a chronic inflammation marker. We have good reference ranges now by a big family center study from Professor Merle, a chronic fatigue specialist in Brussels, and also he did it in uh, autism, and 70% uh, of autistic children, they all had no CD57 cells. So, it makes sense to test autistic children for CD57 cells, if maybe a bacterial infection is behind or co-factor of this autistic disorder. This is about the early spot, um, the medical doctors are allowed to order here in your region, but uh, not the naturopath, but you need a medical doctor for that. Um, this is one of my arts, the early spot, um, where I do, I think, in the world most of these testings. It's then a game changer, it has sensitivity of around 84%, specificity is 94%, now I think it's bad, it's not 100%, but you never will have a level to adjust it. 100% specificity and 100% sensitivity, it's not possible, otherwise the test is bad. The Inispot um, is a robust um, and it's very reproducible, it's a flow cytometry, it can be retested, and in these authors they say also please do it together with the CD7 cells that was approved in 2012. This is like an example of the report is working. If you do an Inispot in the laboratory, Inispot is coming, I have also medical doctors, I I had, I had some corporations here at universities with daily spots, so the daily spot will be also the future in laboratory medicine in the near future. And very important for me, because I told you before, not everybody is producing antibodies, not every patient will find antibodies. Look at the T cells, and we have now more and more 
possibilities to look by the Elispot for Babesia, Bartonella, Bodleia Motoi. There's also an issue, mycoplasma, we look a lot for viruses, cytomegal virus, action bar virus, and we look for herbal simplex virus, varicella, sostenic, chlamydia pneumonia. We can talk about how what chlamydia pneumonia is wrong, makes also chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, it's in combination with Lyme disease very often. And this is what um, ICL did, and uh, you can get it from the ICL group. It's an overview. How sensitive and how specific is the test selection for you now? And we did some thoughts about that. What's uh, also to spare costs for your patients? Because I, I earn money from laboratory testings, but I'm also a medical doctor, and I say to my patients, you need your money more for therapies than for laboratory testings. Although that's it's it's against what I'm doing. No, but my heart is the patient to help the patient and to improve the patient, not to, to earn uh, 10,000 euro by laboratory test. Uh, that it's, it's not my idea because I want to help them. That's my my heart. So what you can do as a cost-effective Lyme screening would be you can. I would prefer the last one. I would do the tick-tack spacing because we have the round bodies in it, and I would do also the ELIS body if it's possible for you. You can do also if you want to do the optimal, we have more money for a patient. You do the A spot if, if it's possible for you. For the current activity, you do tip to spacing to test the IgG, IgM antibodies, and the round bodies included, and you do the Sierra spot. So and then you have the DLSE in it too. Um, the optimal panel would be to do A spot, tick back spacing, and Sierra spot, and the uh, cost effective version would be to do for me the tick back spacing. It's better than to do nothing. It's not so expensive, the tick back spacing um, testing, and it's, it's less than a Western block, for example. So just not, not to go into deep, I cannot uh, bring you all this knowledge within 45 or 50 minutes. Um, we have a lot of problems with Babesia, we have a lot of problems with Bartonella, we have a lot of problems with Alicia plasma, we have a lot of problems with Ecatsia, Coxella, these are named for co-infections in the ticks, tick-borne diseases. Um, but we have also a lot of problems with chlamydia, chlamydia pneumonia and trachomatis, sexual transmitted, allergen transmitted, and they found chlamydia in the ticks. And I make sometimes joke, I say, okay, how is chlamydia coming into a tick? It's allergen transmitted, not a pathogen. Chlamydia pneumonia, it's very common as well. Or mycoplasma. Maybe one tick is coughing at the other tick, and then they get infected by a tick cough. I don't know. I don't know. But it's hypothetical. But we know that the PCR is doing and the PCR is great. We find a lot of viruses in the complexity of that patient, multiple infection. This I want to show that I, I brought some new aspects to you because multiple sclerosis, I told you, Lyme disease can mimic it. A patient with Lyme disease can develop multiple sclerosis symptoms or like symptoms. And then you have to treat it for Lyme disease and not with immune suppression, which will damage the patient. The patient will die after a while. So it makes sense to treat a patient for Lyme disease if the patient has Lyme activity in the blood and the symptoms for Lyme disease, then you have to treat the patient for Lyme disease. But action bar-wise, it's a big issue also for, for multiple sclerosis. EBV, it's, a, it's really threatening in the world. That's a new study that came out in June um, this year. And they found out that uh, the EB and A1, this is part of the antibodies, seropositivity with an S, it, uh, it's a, a cross-ratio of ethnic groups and between studies points uh, to a strong biological link between EBV infection and MS risk, not the cytomegal virus. They belong to the herpes viruses. Herpes virus group 1 to 8. Huh? HSV1, HSV2, you know, cytomegal virus, you have the EBV virus, you have the varicella uh, zoster virus, you have HHV6, you have HHV7, and you have HHV8. HHV6 is also neurovirus, it makes also multiple sclerosis. And I found yesterday a patient with positive PCR in the blood. So, what does that mean? If you have Borrelia infection plus virus infection, this is now the field for the lepteropaths. Because the medical world is like, like me, we don't have a solution for virus infection. Believe me. Every, uh, me too. We need you. We need natural paths for the immune system, for destroying the viruses. You can try that by herbs, whatever you can do. But we medically, we are helpless. 
We, we cannot uh, fight against HIV. We don't have any. We have the viral statics, but we, we have chemistry. But this is not solving the problem. We can reduce the viral load. That's possible. We have some viral statics also against action virus, which can improve the patient. So very important. Varicella sosterwise, during you know, chicken pox. But this is maybe the first problem. Then you develop apososter. And in South Asia, they did a new study with 23,000 patients. That's a brand new study from July 2017. I, I don't think you have heard about it. 23,000 patients with purpose soster. And they found in 35% after that, they developed an apoplectic stroke of this purpose soster. Uh, patients and 59% of myocardial infarction, a heart attack, 59% with herpes zoster. So it's really threatening. Herpes zoster and the varicella zoster. Really important for you to look at varicella zoster. You can look at it by IgA. I know you cannot do that. Uh, naturopath and medical doctor can do it, and you can do the risk for you, but um, you're restricted to that. So you need medical doctors again. But very important to know about how, how does the virus do that? By meteoritis, they inflame the internal system, and then you get an apoplectic stroke. Chlamydia does the same. Chlamydia makes atherosclerosis, so also get uh, apoplectic strokes. Multiple infection. The more you look, the more you find. Coxsackie virus. I just want to mention every Lyme patient I see has a Coxsackie virus infection. Nearly everybody, 99%. As I told you before, multiple infection, chronic fatigue in every patient. 99% of my patients are diagnosed. I think it's more than 30,000 tests. Meanwhile, all I do, I think, each year around 20,000 testings now. So I think it's nearly 100,000 tests. But everybody has a Coxsackie virus infection. Coxsackie virus that makes fatigue, that makes fever, that makes a sore throat, that makes a diarrhea. It's going within the families. It was found in ticks. It makes cough. It makes congenital virus. It makes, makes the headaches. It makes the juvenile diabetes. There's a high correlation with juvenile diabetes. If you have a patient with juvenile diabetes, please look at Coxsackie virus. Early enough, then you can treat against Coxsackie virus, and then the patient gets rid of the juvenile diabetes. If you come too late, it's too late. It starts with the enteritis, the enterovirus, like the polio and echovirus. So, very important. And they have patients with herb angina, and they develop multiple sclerosis by the transverse myelitis. No doctor, no urologist is looking at that. What's that in medicine? 20 years old patients, also two of them. That's uh, not good for us. You know, we have to work on that. We have to educate each other to tell it, spread it around, please. And uh, look at the papers about it, you can find that. So, multiple symptoms, I'm coming to the end. Multiple symptoms mean multiple infections. The problem is, if a, doc, if a patient is coming to your doctor or the naturopath, they say, oh, doctor, I have now a little fatigue, exhaustion, I have some fever, I have some flu like symptoms, I have some diarrhea. But a lot of these symptoms are overlapping, overlapping. The symptom is not specific for an infection or for one environmental problem, for example. So you have to think about it. But the constellation, the combination of the symptoms, um, they bring us to a higher probability that we have really this infection with mycoplasma. Mycoplasma makes sinusitis, makes slime production, as for the virus patients. It starts with a flu, maybe, some feverish reaction. And therefore, I mean, myself, I developed some years ago with a patient, the co-infection checklist that you can download from the homepage. And this co-infection checklist is fantastic. It correlates exactly with my laboratory test findings. I will bring out the papers uh, soon. So, uh, the more symptoms you have for an illness, the higher is the probability that you will find some thing in the laboratory testings. Whatever you do. So, um, the more symptoms you have for Coxsackie virus, then you test for Coxsackie virus, you find the answer in a positive Coxsackie virus gene. And this spares the costs for the patients, it's also comprehensive for the patients, and it costs no money. It costs, this list costs no money, but it will bring you on the right way because nobody can remember which symptom is possible, which co infection. I, I, I cannot remember this. And thank you very much for your